showers and thunderstorms today with strong southwest wind winds to 37 miles per hour. It's a numbers game, especially for the situation that we're in. We're coming off of a high water event here. The outdoors is not a hobby. It's not our passion. It is our way of life. We make the perfect cast, slow our breathing to execute a perfect shot, spend hours researching locations and techniques. Regardless of effort, we fail. This series is not about incredible bites or trophy animals. Our goal here at Day One Outdoors is to educate our viewers, utilizing new technology to offer a different perspective. Watch as we research new areas, plan out the day, and adjust to changing conditions. If not for other experienced outdoorsmen teaching me along the way, I wouldn't have this life. I owe it to them to pass this knowledge along. I owe it to you. Join us here on Day One Outdoors, and let's learn how to become more successful in the field and on the water from day one. We're going to head down to the pole to start and hopefully get a couple fish. That's our mission. Later in the season for some places, but it's kind of just getting going here. Bam! Ready? You know how to rope. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. You might need to get that anchor ready at some point. This morning we're out here on a tributary in the Pacific Northwest. Our goal today is to showcase what we have to offer here in the summertime. We have both spring chinook and summer steelhead. There are a lot of fish spread throughout the big rivers like the Willamette and the Columbia, but they're also along the coast and the tributaries that flow into the Willamette and the Columbia. So today we're going to talk about techniques and how to target these fish in smaller water. It's a good one. <laughs> All right, so what's the plan here, guys? While we're fishing, we pulled into our first little slot right here, and we passed over a few other holes too, but we stopped here specifically because this is a staging area. There's a few little feeder creeks and even another river that flows in that has a hatchery run that goes up it. Well, this is the deepest hole, the first deepest hole down below it. So we're hoping that these fish are staged up here right now. We're gonna grab a couple of different setups, mainly starting out with bobber and bait, and see if we can't find one or two. Now, typically this time of year for springers, they bite best first thing in the morning, and they should be traveling. So hopefully we'll start seeing some rolling back here in the tail out. If they're rolling, especially in the tail out, that means that they're moving through. We see them rolling up here in the deeper water, that means that they're staging. So right now we're trying to just get a lay of the land and understand how these fish are traveling today so that way we can adjust our techniques accordingly. You got any of that fish, Nick? That's four hot. <laughs> oh yeah. You want a big scrimp, a little scrimp? It don't matter. You be starting like 10. I do. I don't know, I do my bobber stopper at my reel and then the line going out the top and then hanging two feet below my butt of my rod. Salmon slammer, and it's got the garlic in it. Nice, nice bloody tuna, garlic plus. Lay the land. Just asked Ryan what the water temperature was here recently and he looked it up last night and he said it was right around 56 degrees. So because of that, because it's still a little bit cooler, I can start out with some anise bloody tuna here and what I'm doing is I'm adding it to my fish nip. Fish nip is a tuna based bait. You can wrap it on your plugs. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna fish it underneath the bobber. 
in a little spawn sack. So what I'm going to do is flavor it up a little. So take this Anise Bloody Tuna, just put that on the fish nip, and then just mix it up. And you should be able to just form this in your hand, which is really nice. And since I am putting it into a spawn sack, these springers really like a combination of different flavors. So I'm going to add in a little bit of sardine and even a little hunk of sand shrimp into my spawn sack, wrap it up, and put it on my hook. Let's give them a lot of different flavors. Uh, we're out here today just trying to trying to catch a spring chinook. The river is as perfect as you can get. It's uh, about eight foot eight inches, and it's uh, probably four feet of visibility, so it's just about ideal. Just got to make it happen. Bait today, we're going to use uh, salmon eggs, cured salmon eggs. Pretty sure everybody here has uh, procured cured eggs. I'm sure, it's a pretty good bet. And then uh, usually we tip it with all kinds of other extra scents. Either sand shrimp, we have tuna bellies, we have, looks like Cody's cutting up a chunk of sardine, we have fish nip. Um, what else do we have? We have coon shrimp, we have prawns. We'll probably throw all kinds of stuff at them until we find out what flavor they like this morning. So I think all three of us are gonna start off the glob of eggs and then tip it with different chunk of bait and see who gets bit first. And, Go from there, make a plan. Going back in back eddy. Yeah. We've been fishing this hole for about 45 minutes now, and Ryan had one bobber down, and that's really been our only bite. So you would think that it's about time to move, spending this much time, three guys with different baits, pounding the same water over and over again. But there are a lot of springers that we've seen rolling here in this spot. You don't leave fish to find fish. Come on, right off the point. What we need to keep doing is keep changing our depth. This is a very deep hole of 20 to 30 feet of water, so we just Keep changing our depth from 10 feet, because the fish will be suspended, all the way on down to the bottom. Keep switching up baits, using different scents, until we figure out what these fish want to key in on. We found the fish, now we just need to figure out what they want to eat. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple fish in here, I'd say. We've been fishing uh, bobber and eggs all morning, and the uh, had Ryan had one bite, and it's been kind of tough. So I figured with the warmer water, I'd come up here and flip a spinner up at the head end of the hole, up in the faster water, and sure enough, whack. We're down there still bobber fishing. And we hear Jason yelling, "Fish on!" Hatchery fish. It's clipped right here, so we can harvest this fish. We are below where we put these hatchery spring chinook in the river, so definite possibility of getting one today. And we kind of talked about that. There's been quite a few hatchery fish in the river this, this year, so yeah. it's cool to see one. Nice shape too, nice bright fish. Well, this time of year too, you know, we're, we're getting close to midsummer. That's actually pretty good color for a tributary fish. Yeah. And these are springers, so they're not going to spawn until later on in the fall, October, November. Right. Yep. So that meat's still going to cut great. I, I can't tell you how many darker fish I've caught that actually cut blood red, just oh, yeah. like a March Springer. So that's, that's awesome that we got 
a fish. Not only that, but it's a hatchery fish. So we get to take it home and harvest it. Bonus. Bonus fish. Nice job, Jason. Nice. Thanks, Spinner. Hey, what's cool is that that is the exact same deal that we used to do all the time back when we were all a lot younger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cast the spinners for Spring Chinook this time of year. Still works. Still <laughs> works. <laughs> it's proof. Fishfield is your one-stop shop online for the gear you need here in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. From salmon and steelhead, saltwater, trout and kokanee, even crabbing. Visit fishfield.com today to place an order with no sales tax and have the gear you need shipped fast. Fishfield.com, we have what the Northwest Outdoorsman needs. Every once in a while, a new lure comes along that catches every angler's attention. It could be because of all the irresistible colors and finishes, or the patented skip beat action, or maybe it's the wide variety of sizes designed for salmon, trout, walleye, steelhead, mackinac, and more. But just for the record, we know one thing for certain. We didn't design the maglip to catch fishermen. Yakima Bait Company. Well, Jason just hooked this fish right here. While we're still down here dealing with this one, he just had another bite, hooked it and missed it. Sounds like he might've had another grab too, just in a matter of a handful of casts. So he's yelling at us from way up there saying, hurry up, grab your spinners and come on up. So that's what we're doing right now. I hooked for a fish in there. What? I hooked for a fish. What? When the fish hit, I set the hook and it came off almost immediately, so. What I ended up doing was I took another cast and I hooked another one at the same line angle and it came in unbuttoned as well. Just headed over to the other side. Sometimes when you get in the top end of a hole like this, you get a little different approach on the fish with your spinner. It'll, uh, it'll trigger a bite, even on fish that have been pounded on for a while. So we're gonna give it a whirl. When you're fishing spinners and you do end up hooking a fish and you have biters in the hole, the mistake I made is not taking a few steps down. Because what happens is, is when your spinner's running through a, through a run and it's kind of quartering downstream, the fish will hit it at the side profile and it has a tendency to hook the fish more in the corner of the mouth. And you have a lot better hook to land ratio. down. I figured if I could get the bait down to where the fish were, it would work, so. You knew I'd figure it out. Oh, yeah. Ooh, nice, nice little same size fish, Jason. Same size. One with a head shake. Oh, man, it's just digging me. Yeah, it's shallow. It's like eight feet. Yeah, pretty shallow. It's actually tapping bottom. What was it? And I'm kind of walking it, walking it through there, kind of like bobber dogging almost. Kind of. But then it just right where it gets, where you can't feel the bottom. It went under and I reeled down. I'm like, yep, that's something chewing on it. Set the hook. Water's like perfect temperature for these things. It's a wild one. I don't know, you want to grab it then, Cody, or what? Yeah, we'll keep it in the water. Yeah, that's what I mean. I got to get, I'll drag it up here close, but. Where are you at, I can get him. He's right here. Got a little lasso around the mouth. Jason hooked a few up here on spinners, and uh, I came up here and brought the spinner up at first, and I actually ended up breaking one off and losing it. Um, he hooked a couple more, and so I grabbed the bobber rod, shallowed it way up. I think I was only seven or eight feet on the bobber, and wham, bobber down, here we go. Uh, this one is a fish, natural fish here that spawned in the river, wild fish as they call it. Um, beautiful fins, big adipose fin here, so we're gonna have to let it go, but that's not a big deal. This boy gave up a good fight. He's probably, oh, I'd say 12, 14 pounder. Nice fish, but good specimen. It's pretty shallow in the head of the hole here where the current is. 
starts off only three or four feet deep and drops into, you know, 15, 20, almost 30 feet in the back of the hole. But I shallowed up the bobber at about eight feet and actually it was dragging as the bobber starts going through. Um, as soon as it stopped tapping the bottom, the bobber started standing up straight. Went under, I reeled down and feel the fish chewing on it and set the hook. Yeah, buddy. I think honestly, we finally just got a little bit of sun on the water. Well, these fish have tucked up here. We found where we found where the biters are. So with the sun on the water, starting to push up, and it's more covered up water with that ripple and uh, a little more oxygenated, it might be a bit more aggressive. Well, it makes sense. The water's faster, oxygen, cooler water coming in. You got the cover of the broken water on top, and then. It's dirty enough, milky enough water, they can sit in three or four feet of water and still feel safe. So you don't have to be down there in 20 feet of water. I know there's fish down there, but they weren't biting. We found the biters. <laughs> I mentioned a second ago what we caught it on. That was the Procure uh, Red Hot Double Stuff UV Glow eggs. And you can see what's left of the skein here. I also did have a little chunk, small chunk, just thumbnail size of tuna belly on here. in the deepest part of the hole and right where it starts to tail out, it starts to shallow up. Every single hole is built exactly the same regardless of what tributary that you're fishing. It all starts out with a ripple up top, drops into the bucket into the deepest part of the hole, and then slowly starts to shallow up into the tail out. So Jason's hitting the back end back here. I'm actually gonna start up at the top and that's because uh, Jason and Ryan both got fish at the top end of the last hole. So I'm sure Ryan will just work his way in between Jason and I I will just keep pounding this with bobbers. It's fairly slow current. Bobbers and maybe a spinner might be the best techniques to use right here. Gets me every time. How's it been? Gotta put it back. Dude. Failed. <laughs> Do you see where it was hooked? I can see it shining right there. It's, it's so were you on that inside seam right here? Uh, it just got right, probably down the throw, right in the middle. Uh, probably just straight towards that rock sticking out of the water. Okay, so towards the tail out, right where it shallow out. Yeah, it's starting to shallow out. I'm not fishing very deep. I'm only like eight, eight or nine, nine feet, feet deep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Brutal. Oh, try again. That's good. You saw it though? Yeah, nice bright fish. I'm trying to take my leader all good. up though. I'm going to change that up. Really? It's chafing it up? They run around on the rocks down there. There's yeah. a big ledge. When it ran up here, I'm sure it got all under the rocks. Well, like you said, that usually doesn't happen too often when uh, when you hook them on a bobber to lose them. And no, so, I had that on for a good minute or so. Yeah, so I, I'm guessing that he just barely came up, just barely nipped it. Bobber went under pretty good, and I reeled down, felt some chewing on it, set the hook. Huh. It is what it is. Well, I'm going to go Try grab again. my stick again. That yeah, was fun. You? I'm getting rebaited here right now after Ryan just lost that fish and created my own little spawn sack here with the fish nip in it once again. I'm gonna go ahead and put that on. But I'm gonna give you guys a quick rundown on the setup that we're using. So Ryan has hooked two fish, landed one, and Jason just missed that one on this bobber setup. You guys are both baiting up and it gives me a little time to catch up with them. <laughs> so what we have going on here when you're out here bobber fishing is you want about eight and a half to nine foot long rod. A bait caster reel is nice, but not necessary. You can also just use a spinning reel, which has become popular here lately, just because they're a little bit easier to use, less backlashes. This rod here is actually a nine foot three rod. I like it just because it's perfect action for casting long distances, especially heavy weights, but has plenty of backbone to set the hook from a little bit further away. Braid line is a must when you're bobber fishing. This is 65 pound maximum braid eight. I like the 65 pound because it floats on top of the surface. You definitely don't need 65 pound. You can sink down to 50, but I just do this for diameter because again, the little bit thicker diameter keeps it up on the surface. From there, we go down our line to our bobber. This is a Fishbeel three ounce bobber. 
And we're using these larger bobbers because we're fishing faster water and deeper water. From here, I have two egg sinkers. And I actually have four ounces of lead down here on the bottom. And the reason why is because I want this bobber just barely sitting above the surface. These Chinook can bite really, really light, very subtle bite. So instead of it sitting right here at the water line with three ounces, I add an extra ounce and bring that up a little bit higher so I can see the slightest little bite. On down below our leads, I have a fish field chain swivel. These are the tornado chain swivels here and I've been really happy with them. I like that it has a few more points where it can spin. When you're running baits, they tend to spin up down there. The last thing you want to do is twist up your line. The leader line that I'm running here, this is 20 pound maximum fluorocarbon. Do we need fluorocarbon out here? Not necessarily, just because it's a little bit milky water. But I have been running 30 pound ultra green and Ryan got bit twice on the 20 pound maximum fluorocarbon. So I downsized and went to fluorocarbon as well. On the bottom here, that's a three aught fish field single point hook, octopus style bend, and it has a cutting point as well. And then of course the bait is fish nip with a few little added oils and a little bit of sand shrimp and sardine in there. Give these fish a little bit different look. Now they're already fishing again, dang it. Let's see if I can go pick one out from between them. Salmon swim up to 3,000 miles to return to their exact place of birth to reproduce. Well, most of the time. Putting on some more of these Procure eggs here. Got a little glob going. I'm just going to find a little small chunk in here and freshen up the bait a little bit. A few more on there, and then I also have a little chunk of tuna belly I can see hidden in there. So. That's when I lost a fish on here a minute ago, and Jason just had another bite, so there seemed to be a few biters in here. Hopefully we can get another one. I was deep on the last two or three casts, I figured I'd shallow up a touch. Let's see, so what end credit piece are you going to use for me? The banana slow motion, or the feet propped up on the cooler? Or this one. What's this one? You do something good for me. That's like your cute. No, I, I already did something. No, goofy. you can do something goofy. Come on, you, you gotta give me something. I'm fishing here. Yeah, no, stop fishing and do something goofy. <laughs> this morning we ended up fishing bobbers most of the morning, and then as the day progressed and the sun hit the water, I decided to go up above and fish spinners this morning. So, what I ended up doing was I ran a yeah. size. Sorry, Jason. Not really. I'm sick and tired of my mentality where I always have to do something different. Yeah, why don't you do something I've done for like my whole life in this hole? Well, no, you and Jason both just hooked fish back here, and I'm like, I can go up to the head of the hole. <laughs> the fish yeah, are, there's no one. The fish are back there. <laughs> Clearly. Fish where they're not, Cody, that's smart. Yep, I'm working on it. Well, that one's actually a little higher. Let's see if we can keep this one on the hook for a little longer this time. Another smaller one with shiny. It's a bobber down, that's all I know. Well, that one was a no doubter. It was out there in the middle of deep stuff. I wasn't any worry about the bottom or anything. I, I put the wood to that one. Dude, this, the water temp is perfect, mid 50s. You know that. You talk about you want optimum temperature for fishing for salmon in the summer. 56. You can't do any better. Well, this glacier fed stream. This is late June and the water temps in the mid 50s. That's not very normal. Usually, the last few years around here, it's well, that is it's got a rotor on. It's got a, it's got a rotor. It's a native fish. That's all right though. Nice, brand new bright fish. Nice. Woo, pretty fish. Pretty fish. Right in the beak. Sweet. Yeah, I got a picture. That's beautiful. I took the bobber down again on those Procure uh, UV eggs again. They're liking those today. 
I did have a chunk of sand shrimp on that one. Actually lost my tuna belly and put a chunk of sand shrimp on. So. Nice. For, Ju far, for uh, June, that's yeah. pretty, pretty chrome. The end of June for, we're what, 10, 15 miles up the river here, on tributary, and it's pretty impressive. That's a nice fish, so. Yeah. Let him on his way, do his thing, huh? God, it's beautiful looking, aren't they? Swim off slow, fishy. He is, too. He's, he's just hanging. He's cool. Will he stay upright if you let go of him? No. So. <laughs> there he goes. All right. Thanks, Chase. Yeah, hey, buddy. Good job, man. Nice. Bam. Yes, Ryan has caught a lot more fish than me today. Everybody has today. But you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm always trying something different. It's my own demise, I guess. <laughs> hey, we got a lot of water to go. <laughs> I know. We counted this hole here pretty hard, and it was actually really good to us. We picked up. Uh, what? We hooked three out of here? Three bites, hooked three two. Bites. Landed one. one. And it's actually a really small little slot, so I think we milked it for all it's worth. We're going to keep on moving down and see what else we can find. about 18, 19 years ago, and since I started coming here, there's been a lot of changes. It's just banks sloughing off, as you can see in the background right here. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of movement in the river, and with that, you got holes that we used to shook fish there that have, over the years, went from 10 to 12 feet deep to two feet deep. So it's just there's always lots of changes. And, different holding water forms and different and good holding water that used to be really good is completely gone. So it's, it's things happen that way. So.